Hello, and thank you for joining us on Talking Eds, the podcast about all things education here at the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Yvonne Taylor. Previously, to celebrate Black History Month, the College of Education produced a celebratory and informative photo essay titled Black Hair, Unbothered and Unedited. Several Black faculty, staff, and students who wear their hair in natural styles like afros, twists, and locks share what wearing their hair naturally means to them. The photo essay gave many an opportunity to share their Black hair joy and their Black hair journey. Black hair in America has often been policed and punished. This occurs in educational spaces like K-12 through schools and in the workplace. In today's Talking Eds podcast, we're revisiting the topic of black hair with four of the faculty members who were featured in the photo essay, whose research also provides additional insight and context into the ramifications of and the remedies to policing black hair in schools and workplaces. Joining us are Dr. Kefferlyn Brown. Dr. Brown's research and teaching focuses on the sociocultural knowledge of race in teaching and curriculum, critical, multicultural teacher education, and the educational discourses and intellectual thought related to African Americans and their educational experiences in the United States. Dr. Terrence Green's research examines the relationship between educational leadership, schools, and neighborhood and communities with a focus on racial and educational equity. A theme of Dr. Kevin Coakley's research is understanding the psychological and environmental factors that impact African-American student achievement. And Dr. Richard Reddick's research and teaching is on the history of higher education, multicultural modes of mentoring, and social and cultural contexts of education. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you and your families are well, and it's good to spend time with you again, digging into the topic of black hair. I'm gonna start with Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, black hair is policed in both the K through 12 space and in the workplace. You wrote a book a few years back called Challenging the At-Risk Label. I see some parallels between the scrutiny given to black students' hair and the subsequent policing of it in the K through 12 space and a similar problematic labeling of black students. Um, can you share your thoughts about that? When we think about um, at-riskness, um, at riskness has historically been uh, an idea that's linked to the racial, gendered, cultured, class identities of students. And so if we think about that as a sort of starting point for your question, uh, when we think about Black children, Black people and their hair, we live in a society that has to pass legislation in order to uh, allow black people the freedom to wear their hair as it naturally occurs on their on their heads. Um, the, it, it's ridiculous saying it out loud um, that 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 is something that is needed and necessary. Um, but when we think about at riskness, we're literally at risk because of who we are fundamentally who we are. And um, it, it, it's a problem. It's been a problem for a very long time. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm living in a time period where people are recognizing the, the, the ludicrousness of it and are really saying we've got to do something about this. Um, you mentioned the legislation. Um, can you or, or any of um, the other faculty um, in this call um, talk a little bit about what you understand as far as the legislation like the Crown Act um, that's um, happened in other parts of the country. Yeah, uh, well, the Crown Acts are taking place in a number of jurisdictions. Sometimes they're uh, municipal, sometimes they're statewide. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it will prohibit discrimination based on uh, hairstyles, which, uh, to Kefflin's point, it sounds ridiculous, but um, there have been so many examples of of uh, black people in the workforce, uh, black people in schools, uh, being expelled or punished or otherwise terminated because of their hairstyles. And the, the bizarre thing, of course, is that um, virtually every case I've heard, if a person has like a, a, a dreadlock hairstyle, they'll accommodate it. They'll pull their hair up, like I have my hair pulled up right now. 
um, because we all, you know, we all get it. Like it's not the most convenient hairstyle if you're working in a food establishment, for instance, so you pull it up, right? Uh, but despite that, it's not enough to accommodate uh, for a lot of uh, employers and schools. They want you to actually cut the hair. And so this happened uh, in Texas earlier this year um, with a gentleman, uh, his name was, uh, oh gosh, um, DeAndre Arnold. And folks will remember the situation where he was able to be on the red carpet with uh, Gabriella Union, Dwayne Wade, and uh, Matt Cherry uh, as a part of the celebration for the uh, nomination of the uh, film they did. Um, but really, it just speaks to the absurdity that we have to have a legislative act to prohibit that kind of discrimination because, uh, you know, as Kefflin said earlier, this is these are people's natural uh expressions of their uh, their hairstyles. Uh, there's nothing elaborate or, or ridiculous about it. It's just how people's hair naturally occurs. But we don't see those kinds of legislations uh, leveled or prohibitions uh, against uh, white hairstyles, but we see it against black hairstyles. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Green, you focus most, much of your work on creating equitable environments in K through 12 schools. How do school policies about hair impact Black students in particular and perpetuate inequity? Well, first I was going to say um, it's an honor to be on here with my colleagues and with each of you. And uh, thank you all for holding space for an important conversation such as this. So in terms of the impacts uh, of such policies on Black students, I think they are, are diverse and they're complex and they're immense. And I'll talk about those in a second, but I want to take just a step back um, because I think people need to understand the context in which American schooling was created and which it's still perpetuated, right? And so we know the foundations of schooling in the U.S. are anti-Blackness, racism, and white supremacy. And so when you understand from a historical perspective that enslaved Africans by their captors were made to have, they, they, they literally would cut their hair. They would cut enslaved Africans' hair why? Because they wanted to disconnect them and to erase them from their culture, to disconnect them and to erase them from their ethnic identity and to literally disconnect and erase them from who they literally were. So when we fast forward into our current times where schools have policies around what is appropriate hair, what is conventional hair, what is clean hair and requiring black students to cut their hair, they are participating in this long legacy, in this long history of anti-Blackness, racism, and white supremacy that, talking about the impacts, it's an erasure of Black identity, of Black culture, of who we are uh, when those policies require us to cut our hair. The second impact is, is that it allows school systems to perpetuate this mythical norm that white hair is like the, the normed hair, right? It's, it's, it's the... It, it continues to perpetuate that myth. But I think the third thing too is that it perpetuates a false narrative of superiority for white people looking and thinking that they have some type of hair that is norm, that is quote unquote regular, that is quote unquote good. And it's, it sends that false uh, narrative there. And so oftentimes people say, well, how does white supremacy show up in school? How does, how does uh, anti-blackness and how does racism show up in school? It shows up in schools by you continue to do business as usual. And business as usual is the same archetype of cutting hair to erase who we are and what we bring. And when we, and when we have policies that, that allow that to go on, that is detrimental. The last thing I'm gonna say is that just like policies have been used to resurrect or create these conditions, I believe that we can use policies, one, to deconstruct these conditions, but also to reconstruct a more equitable, uh, environment. And so I think that that comes through first having education policies that specifically address the realities and the experiences of black students. And as you come through developing policies there, that's how you create racially just school environments, not just black students, but for every kid that's in that school. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? You, you, you're saying that um, just as policies can perpetuate these kinds of inequities um, and anti-blackness um, and, and racism, um, policies can do the reverse. Can you give an example of what that might look like? Yeah, I think, so what we know about um, design and design-based research is that when you begin to design for the edges or when you design for what's on the margins, um, it's actually more inclusive and more beneficial for everybody that's a, a part of that design program. 
so the idea is when you go into schools and you look at the data and you try to understand who is having the most marginal experience, even when people want to, you know, look at it by multiple identities, when you get start to disaggregate it by race, you often begin to see that black students are um, having some of the most adverse experiences in schools. And so what I'm saying is that when you develop a policy, you don't think about black students as an afterthought. You think about their experiences, their schooling conditions as, at, at the very beginning, and then that's how you go about building and constructing um, what an education policy will look like. Now, I can't say that education, that's been the common practice of education policy, but I think we're at this moment now that we no longer need to have physical examples to do what we know is right, what our ancestors have been saying. And so I think part of our work is that forward facing work to not only um, reimagine, but to like rebuild and reconstruct schools that are centered around not just being included because you can have a room that's full Imagine a room that's full and I come right by the door and y'all squish me in. Well, I'm included in the room, but I'm not centered and I'm not belonging in that room. And so we want to have policies that center where black students belong. Right. And, and you know, what you're saying makes me think about the fact that we often refer to um, schools in America as having a school to prison pipeline. And I know, um, Dr. Brown, from the work that you're talking about, these social cultural contexts of schooling, these types of policies likely help to facilitate that type of pipeline. Well, <clears throat> if you don't like school, or if school seems uh, irrelevant to your experiences, you don't want to be there. Uh, you can disengage. Uh, and, and in some ways, you may even opt out because it's not, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a place you want to be. But there are other students who may be in schools, but because of the way that they perform their identities, the way that their, their identities are marked on their bodies, and those particular identities have already been positioned as problematic or, you know, resistant, whatever the term might be, they then may get pushed out, right? So you've got multiple, uh, multiple uh, practices that are taking place in schools, but fundamentally they speak to this larger practice that, that Dr. Green mentioned. You know, it, there's been a, a sort of norming of whiteness in the context of living in a society that's that is that is that is designed to be um, sort of racist uh, and also anti-black, right? So whether you're getting pushed out, whether you feel like you need to leave because it's irrelevant, all of those will contribute. Both of those will contribute to um, a sort of lack of engagement, right. and then a sort of leaving and not being a part of that of, of that school. You don't you don't feel a part of it, and you aren't a part of it. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Coakley, I want to bring you into this conversation at this moment, too, because what um, both Dr. Green and Dr. Brown are describing, that um, erasure and of Blackness and the anti-Blackness and the norming of whiteness, um, I think really sp speak, your work speaks to this as well from a, a different lens. Um, you're an educational psychology professor whose research focuses on the psychological impacts of racism on Black people. Um, as well as um, a challenging the idea um, and the concept of anti-intellectual, um, the perception of Black people. Can you share your insights from your research about um, what Black hairstyles and the norming of white, whiteness and white hair may mean to Black students and the psychological impacts of these types of responses to Black hair? No, of course. Um, so one of the first things I'll start by saying is that when I talk to people about who I am, I tell them that I am a black psychologist. I am not a psychologist who happens to be black. Um, I am a black psychologist. And I, and I say that intentionally because my black lived experience informs the way that I do my work and informs my teaching and in practice and informs um, really the way that I understand black people. And, and so it, I don't happen to be a black person who is, is a psychologist. So, so that said, it's important that when we think about the Black experience, we think about some of the themes that have characterized the Black experience. 
black psychologists have talked about these things, including um, the importance of improvisation, the importance of creativity. And when you think about black hair, um, one of the things that I think distinguishes black hair um, from, from all other um, hairstyles is, is the fact that we as a people have been so incredibly creative and imaginative um, and improvisational with our hairstyles. I mean, to the point where you see um, other groups that will try to emulate sort of what we do. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm sure that my fellow panelists can, can identify with this. When I think about, you know, some of the conversations that I've had in, you know, when black barbershops or, or black lacticians or other sort of stylists, and when they talk about, for example, when white folks just make the decision to get locked. And um, it's always quite humorous um, when we have these conversations because, you know, on the one hand, you know, getting locked hair and the process that it requires um, does not ne necessarily happen easily for, for white folks. Um, yet in looking at sort of black folks and sort of, you know, really sort of taking culturally appropriating, if you will, from, from our culture, it becomes a style that um, is, is seen as, as cool, as something that is, is desirable when it's, you know, on white people. Of course, that is, has not been the case necessarily for black folks, but we have always been lauded for our ability to be sort of creative and improvisational, although um, we see through many, many examples that that comes with a certain cost. Um, our hairstyles have also been an expression of, of our identities. And I, and I distinguish identities from, from ideologies because we know that everyone who has natural hair, hairstyles aren't activists and they aren't sort of like people who are trying to sort of march their cause. Um, but they are certainly expressions of, of our identity in, in many ways. Um, some would argue that even then that might be overstating it because some people just wear the hairstyles because they, they like it and, them, and they might not see any deeper meaning in terms of their cultural or racial identity. And that, that certainly is the case. But oftentimes you will see that the hairstyles represent an expression of our racial and cultural identity. Um, and in terms of psychological impact, as a black psychologist and specifically as an African-centered black psychologist, I'm always very concerned about how we as a people um, internalize some of the messages that we receive around blackness and now what we are sort of referring to as anti-blackness. Um, black people um, have been made to feel that in order to be successful, we have to emulate white people. That has been, you know, really the message that we have received for, for many, many years. Of course, we, we understand this to be very dehumanizing and negating our lived experience. Um, I'm reminded uh, a few years ago, um, what happens when we as a people internalize these attitudes. Some of you may recall um, back in 2012 when the Dean of the Hampton University Business School banned locks and cornrows uh, because he said that the ban had been effective in helping students land corporate jobs and that they should look the part when searching for unemployment or searching for employment. Um, he said that, you know, locks and cornrows were not considered to be a professional look and it was their job to ensure that their students are able to, to land corporate jobs. And of course, this, you know, you know caused quite a bit of uproar. Um, the ban specifically applied to male students in the fifth year of their MBA program seminar class, as I recall. And uh, you know, again, as, as, a, as a black psychologist, as an African centered black psychologist, I find this deeply, deeply problematic. And one of the things that black psychology has done for psychology is it has given us different conceptual frameworks to understand what we believe to be specific cultural um, sort of instances of mental unhealth um, or unmental health or, or a behavior that is certainly not healthy from a black perspective. Um, I'm reminded of one of our recently uh, deceased black psychologists, um, Kobe Cambon, and he talks about this idea called cultural misorientation. And, and essentially what he meant by that is that cultural misorientation includes these, these behaviors and, and attitudes that black folks have internalized that really sort of undermine and negate um, sort of who we are as, as black people, as people of African descent. He gives many, many examples. I won't go through them all, but one of the specific examples that he gives and one that causes my students particular consternation is what we do with our hair. So he uses as an example, the obsession with curling and straightening our hair to approximate what he refers to as the Caucasian so-called good hair texture look. Now, my students get heated, as you might imagine, um, because when you start talking about perming of your hair, 
Um, students see that as being a personal decision. They don't read into it that is any sort of political or ideological statement or a statement of sort of anti-blackness or negating or you know, sort of that, who they are as black people. But as black psychologists and as African-centered black psychologists, we would challenge that assertion, whether students or whether people are consciously aware of it or not, because it, there is fundamentally the idea that we can't, in all of our sort of beautiful blackness and the coarseness of our hairs, we can't sort of accept that who we are and the manifestation of, of our natural sort of beauty, that it has to be altered in some way in order to fit a particular aesthetic that would be acceptable to white people. And so as a black psychologist, again, that's something that I find deeply, deeply disturbing. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Coakley, for, for sharing your perspective um, and insight on, on that. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of our conversation, um, each of you are professors here at the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, it's the top ranked college of education in the state of Texas and one of the top public colleges of education in the country. You all have natural hair and have gained an education and have professions in which you can influence both thought and the educational and psychosocial experiences of black students. What can you share about your own experiences as black professors with natural hair um, in academic and intellectual spaces? I, I'll, I'll start off. If, if, if you don't mind. So I, I remember when I started this, this natural hair um, process, and I, I started my locks in, I think around 1999, maybe 2000. And, and I was a young assistant, um, untenured professor at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. And I remember uh, sort of my thinking during that time that initially I wasn't, I had not sort of fully committed to having a hairstyle, um, keeping it permanently. Um, it was something that I thought, you know, looked, you know, really good that, that fit who I am in terms of a, a scholar, who I was trying to be as a scholar, but I was not fully committed and had not fully internalized the reasons why it really was right for me. And I'm, I may have shared this story before. I remember my mother, when I started growing them, and we all sort of remember the process of growing locks, and you start off with the little twist, and they, they look all crazy and, and unkempt. And you know, my mom, you know, asked me. She said, "Well, Kevin, do they allow you to look like that as a professor?" And and I had to explain to my mom. I said, "Mom, I'm a professor. I can look however I want to. Like you know, they don't, they can't dictate to me what my hair style should be." Um, but you know, when I when I fast forward now, and when I think about sort of where I am in my career, and thinking about the choices that people will make regarding what, you know, should be the, what people would consider to be a appropriate professional presentation. And, you know, if you look in around, how many college presidents do you see with locks or cornrows? How many provosts do you see with locks or cornrows? For that matter, how many deans do you see with locks or cornrows? And so you get the message that if you want to advance in your career, and certainly within an academic setting, that you will have to have a particular aesthetic that will be acceptable um, within a you know, context of higher education. And that's something I struggle with because what I'm clear about is that I am not going to change my hairstyle to meet the dictates of what you know is considered to be an appropriate professional appearance for higher level administrators, and if that's what is required, then you know my decision has been made because I will never do that. Um, if I can advance, and if it's meant for me to advance, it's going to have to be on my own professional aesthetic terms. Thank you for that. I just want to um, essentially co-sign to what um, Kevin said, but my 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 journey actually is a is a long one because it started when I was a student affairs professional. And in my very first job in California, of all places, a place called San Luis Obispo, which is probably the whitest part of California you can end up in, I decided I wanted to grow locks. And that's a lot of resonance for me because I was a big fan of Ricky Williams. Uh, my family's half Jamaican. So, you know, uh, Bob Marley and people like that are significant in our lives. So I'm like, I kind of like this. I think I can do this now. And I actually did find a loctician in San Luis Obispo, California, of all places. Um, but I remember having a conversation with my boss. My boss, uh, Preston Allen, was a black man. And I said to Preston, I said, Preston, you know, is this something 
that you would advise me doing? You know, I want to get this hairstyle. You know, what do you think? Um, and he said to me, well, you know, I said, Rich, you're going to make your own choices and have your own things. But, you know, you'll be perceived a certain way with your hair a certain way. And he says, I'm not saying you should have your hair that way or not. I'm just saying there will be a reaction, right? There's not going to be just sort of like, oh, he has locks. That doesn't mean anything. It's going to be, he has locks and that means this or that and the other. And so um, going through that process, and I, just as uh, Kevin described, um, the whole thing about your hair being in various stages of uh, <laughs> unkemptness, uh, but going through that, that, those awkward parts of it and also being educating to people because I didn't really take on that, that goal to become the instructor of lock culture to people. Um, but I had to explain to people, yes, I wash my hair. Uh, yes, uh, my hair can get wet. You know, all these different things that people just had no idea about. Um, and so that was my first uh, sort of immersion with locks. And I uh, went to grad school and I think I cut my locks. Uh, yeah, I cut my locks probably midway through grad school. And I actually came to UT uh, with a low profile Afro. Um, in fact, my very first UT picture, I got a little Afro um, in 2007. And I decided to grow them back again. And first of all, I was just thankful that my hair was still growing. So that was good news. But then the second thing was uh, also just knowing that there was a much more uh, stronger embrace uh, of lock culture now. Um, I mentioned the word uh, journey. And most people will talk about natural hair journeys. Like, and it's very intentional to say that most of us had some kind of experience where we used to have our hair very differently or we used to really... Uh, adhere to another stylistic uh, norm and then you know through our own self-development we come to a point to say like this is something I believe is important I want to embrace it uh, and we take it on and you, you take it on with all the things that come with it and I would say that in my case it's been almost completely positive because when I run into somebody with locks there's almost like a you know a head nod an acknowledgement and like okay you know we we've got some similarities in our experiences and usually we get to hear the stories about how do we come to have locks. Most of us are in our you know, first or second or third or fourth uh, lock iteration. And, um, you know, just really understanding what it means. And, a cert and certainly in, in the case of folks like Rastafarians, you know, how it has a real religious connotation to it. And, and in fact, uh, before I got in this call, I was listening to the song, uh, Time Will Tell by Bob Marley. And he says, you know, Jai will never give the power to the bald head, right? Mm -hmm. He's not talking about bald headed people. He's talking about white people, right? And uh, the juxtapositioning is this is a natural hair of black people. Um, and that's what the Rastafarians believe. You know, when you go into the water, you dip your hair, and the hair will grow the way it's supposed to grow. And most of us have done more aesthetic things to make it look a certain way. Uh, but it's really a fascinating uh, understanding of the power of identity, right? So um, to what Kevin said earlier, this idea that um, it's not just a hairstyle you're wearing. It's something about your identity. It's a form of resistance. It's a form of expressing oneself uh, just on a daily, right? When you see me in my locks, uh, you get a message about me. And uh, I think the message is usually pretty accurate of what I feel I'm doing. I mean, occasionally people assume that I have different religious beliefs and that's not actually the case. But if people get the point that I have a strong sense of pride in my cultural identity, if they get the sense that uh, I've spent a lot of time looking into this and researching this, that's all true. And, and certainly uh, one of the things that's been fun is that my own kids uh, have had interest, right, in, in hair like mine. And of course, I'm always like, well, are you ready for what's going to happen? How are you going to go through this whole thing? Um, but at least we can have that conversation and we can talk about, well, you know, what would it mean for you to have hair like mine as a middle school kid? You know, um, it's a little, a little easier to do when you're in college or older. But I also feel very fortunate, uh, as all my colleagues are, that we're in a field that that's not really part of, of what we deal with. I certainly think there are uh, prejudices and so on and so forth. But, you know, if you were to say to somebody, well, you know, you can't be a professor because your, your locks are, are too long, we'd all laugh at that. That sounds absurd. But I think Kevin made a really good point about the fact that at a certain point, you don't see people uh, in leadership and administrative uh, positions with our styles and is that a function of the fact that um folks either decide to cut their hair at that point or you just don't get to that point because you have this kind of hairstyle it's it's, it's convoluted to me um but i do take notice of this and i do often um talk to uh, 
you know, black administrators about these kinds of things, because a lot of times it'll be like, yes, I went through a period of time where I wore my hair a certain way, but I changed it, you know, and why was that? And certainly I think we all have such uh, personal idiosyncratic uh, reasons why we make those choices. Like, honestly, uh, I have been in a sort of a mindset about lock, cutting my locks for the last couple of years. Um, it's, they're long, <laughs> they get in the way a lot. So, um, and that's really what it's about. It's not about any kind of thing, but also I think about the significance, especially with DeAndre's uh, situation, I kind of felt, well, maybe I need to have them and be on display with this hair uh, a little bit longer because it seems like people still aren't getting it. And I think the fact that we did this photo essay with uh, so many of us um, really sent a message out to um, not just administrators in schools, but also students and parents that, wow, these people are really intelligent and these people are really, you know, top of their game uh, professionally and they have these hairstyles. So amazingly, as I wrote in the, in the article I wrote a little while ago, you know, let's focus what's inside of our students' heads, not what's on their heads. And I actually want to amend that somewhat by saying what their head looks like is important. It's an important part of identity, of what we believe, uh, of our own uh, resistance. And so it's important. I, I, I think if you're like, well, I'm just going to ignore people's hair, that's problematic too. I think you want to embrace the hair they have. And, and perhaps you want to know more about if you have that kind of proximity and that relationship to find out why they made the choice they did to have that kind of hairstyle. Um, I guess I'll say um, my journey is a really long one. The first time that I, I cut all of my hair off, um, a big chop. I was right. <laughs> I was an undergraduate and I was probably in my junior year in, in college. And when I did that, that is not what people were doing. I mean, very few people were doing that. It was sort of a real statement. Like people could make, they could make real assumptions about who you, who they assumed you to be, right? That you were a radical, that you were um, deeply interested in and concerned about Black culture, like immersed in it. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, it, and I, I went to school in Houston, it, it, was, it was almost as if I was a different person. Like I was a totally different person. I mean, people who had known me growing up. And so to do that, it really was, I, in my mind, it was, a, it was something that I was trying to do to really embrace um, my hair, which had, had played a really powerful role for me as a black woman and a black girl um, because I had a lot of hair, long, long hair. And, and so that was sort of a, you know, it was almost an act against God, right? <laughs> to cut my hair off, right? Um, and so I did that, but didn't really know how to take care of it. I didn't know, you know, you know, I didn't even, I didn't go to a barber. I, I, I went to a barber to get it cut the first time, but I didn't really know how to maintain it. And I didn't have a whole lot of support. Um, and there weren't lots of products like there are now where you, you, you know, you can just run in the store and grab things. And even my hairdressers were like, I don't know what, I know you don't think I'm going to do it. I don't know what to do with that. Right. So I kept it for a while and then I eventually uh, relaxed it again. And it wasn't until, so that was like 1992. It wasn't until 1998 smack dab in the middle of when I got, I got engaged. I met, I got engaged pretty quickly, um, but I got engaged. He went away for a trip and I decided to cut my hair off when he came back. Um, so when he came back, I had no hair. This was in 1998 and I have not turned back since then. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, we were in a little bit of a different a little bit of a different time period. Uh, we had a little bit more, I had a little bit more support, but even there moving to Boston, it was hard for me to find someone who could twist my hair. Um, but it, I never, I never felt like I should change it. Very similar to what Dr. Coakley said. I, it, it's, it, that's like one of the I guess I'd say one of the rules that I, I want to sort of live my life by. Um, I have I have a, a set of 
you know, sort of uh, non-negotiables in terms of how I want to express myself and who, who I am. And I think ev I, I, I don't want to ever be in a position where I would need to chemically alter my hair. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't matter to me what kind of obstacle I might face because of my hair. And for the most part, I don't even ask the question about whether there's going to be an obstacle and how do I maneuver. Um, I will say that in recent years, in the last 10 years or so, I've sometimes wondered what kind of style I should or should not wear. And, and a lot of that has to do with my age and what I think is appropriate or not for my age. Um, but for the most part, I am quite, I'm sure that if someone can't accept me this way, then they clearly can't accept a black woman. They can't accept this black woman. And I don't want to be in their presence and I don't want to work with them if that's the case. Um, I'm sure my age is probably part of that. I also have children that look at me. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter and I don't want her to believe that she needs to change her hair to make someone else feel comfortable or for her to fit in that space. And, and as a parent, I've had to watch my children sort of navigate hair issues, my son and my daughter. Um, and the best way I've found to, to help them sort of have a stronger sense of self is for me to affirm through my own choices um, with my hair what is, 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 is beautiful. Um, I will say that I've had probably the only incident that I've had really with my hair happened at the University of Texas at Austin. I, I flat ironed my hair. I didn't chemically alter it, but I flat ironed it a couple of years back. And I don't recall what was going on, but I, 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 flat, I would flat iron it every now and again. And I had a student who put her hands in my hair while I was teaching a class. Um, and it was jarring. And I've, I have never really had anyone reach out and touch my hair. But she, well, she put her hands in my hair because she, I think, was not sure if it was my hair and wanted to know if it was my hair. Um, that's probably the only real situation I had. And I had to take care of it right in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Dr. Brown, you teach pre-service teachers as well, is that right? So yes. you're doing, representing a black woman, um, an intellectual, a scholar, and having that natural hair to, with those who are going to go into classrooms and teach students and teach black students is probably um, also very important um, to them and to you. Yes. I mean, I, I'd like I'd like teachers to go into the classroom affirming who their who the, the their students are, not denigrating them. And as as panelists have said, or my colleagues have said, not attempting to erase who they are uh, because how they look doesn't doesn't fit into their their profile. And one of the things that's been nice about being in this city, and I'm quite frankly, it's surprising that in Austin there is, there are places where you can take little girls to get their hair done in a whole variety of styles that I, I don't even know how to, to, to do. And I say this because doing, um, doing that with my own daughter has allowed her a space in her school and with teachers and with other educators that she comes in contact with to celebrate her hair at a, at a, at a time when for her, she wanted her hair to look a very specific way and it was a normed white way. She wanted her hair hanging and she wanted it long, right? And that's what she would talk about. Um, not realizing in many cases that her hair was long and, and often longer than the children whose hair she was attempting to emulate, right? Um, and so her teachers, um, I don't necessarily know that they picked up on these things, but when I would have conversations with them, and when my daughter would go to school with different hairstyles, they would always sort of affirm her and say, oh, it's so pretty, or I can't wait to see what your hair is going to look like after the weekend. And I really think that that made a difference. And so I want to help instill that kind of cultural awareness and care 
in our in our students, especially those who may be white um, and who don't understand hair issues and the way that those have been integrally connected to our experiences as as uh, black black people in this country. Thank you, Dr. Green. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just for anybody listening to this podcast, I just you know want to say, do not touch a black person's hair, and particularly the white people, because the only people who have touched my hair have been white people. And I'm not an animal. I'm not a zoo. I'm not here to be for you to pet. But that is one of the most disrespectful and dehumanizing things you can do to come and try to pet and touch somebody's hair. So if you're listening to this and you're not, oh, is, is that their hair? Or I'm not sure. Don't go touch it. All right. So that's one thing I want to say. Um, another thing. Um, now my now now I'm, I got hype. I'm thinking about this situation where somebody touched my hair, and they, I'm like, <laughs> like Kevin said, y'all about to draw some nubs back. Don't you be touching nobody here. Um, oh, so my journey it started when I was in undergrad, so uh, almost 20 years ago, and I started growing my hair because. At that time, I had, I had my grandfather was a, a AME African Methodist Episcopal uh, pastor for 50 years. I had grown up in church, but by the time I got to undergrad, it just it was a deeper transformation, right? And um, it was a spiritual deeper transformation in my faith, and I just started growing my hair because um, I just wanted to express what I felt was happening inside. And so my hair was growing for a while. Now, mind you, earlier on in high school. You know, I had the, I was the brother with the waves. I had the, the brush. I was the 360s. I don't know if y'all remember that. Just walk around with the waves. Um, and then uh, I love Tupac. So I had the ball head and I had a magnet earring because my a nose ring. My mama wouldn't let me get a, a, a <laughs> nose ring. So I had a magnet <laughs> earring, but I was Tupac. So my hair went through all these different iterations, uh, but they meant something to me even before I started locking my hair. And so when I was an undergrad, um, I was growing my hair out. And, you know, I just wanted something to express physically on the outside what's happening inside. So initially, I actually wanted to just get uh, some braid. I was going to get them braided and uh, get some cornrows. But time they started braiding, just right there on the side, I was so tenderheaded. I started crying. I was like, ain't no way. I can't do this. And so I, my hair kept <laughs> growing and kept growing and kept growing. And um, I don't know if it was like a moment or anything where I decided, but I knew I wanted to lock my hair. And uh, so I started locking my hair. And so, you know, I graduate. Um, I was a high school science teacher. I'll never forget. Um, so I taught in Kentucky. The school I taught at was a county school. So you had, you know, white, black, poor, from public housing, like everybody in this county high school. And I remember I was teaching an anatomy and physiology class. And um, it was the first day of school. And um, word got back quick. Because by the end of the day, one of my colleagues came to talk to me and said, well, so-and-so's parent don't want them in your class because of your hair. And I was like, really? Yeah, this is the first day of school. Y'all don't want so-and-so in my class. Um, and so then I knew I was on to something. You know what I'm saying? I knew that I was doing something. They, they were white. It was a white family. Um, and I ended up being the student's favorite teacher and all this other stuff. But I knew at that moment, um, personally, that my hair was a political act. And it was a form of political resistance. And there have been times, even now, as, as Rich mentioned, that I've wanted to cut my hair uh, just for the convenience part. You know, hair is all over the place. Uh, I'm gray. I'm getting more gray. I'm like, what's going on with this? And um, I didn't do it because I feel like it's one of my political acts and resistance against white supremacy. And it's who I am. And so there may come a time where I will end up cutting my hair. Uh, but where I am now, like many of my colleagues here, I've, I've made the decision. This is just who I am. This is what I'm bringing. And so either take it or leave it. But I'm comfortable enough in who I am now that this is what I want. And what I love more than anything now, my three-year-old daughter says, Daddy, your locks are so beautiful. Daddy, I want locks now, right? And so like Dr. Brown was saying, like their, their children, our children are watching us. And when I go into schools, the young brothers and sisters, like, you the professor? Oh, what's up? Because automatically from my hair, I can't tell you how many times that have happened. And so I wouldn't trade that for the world. And so 
that's been the evolution of, of my journey with my, my locks. Yvonne, I, I'm sorry, I just have to add this, um, and I want to thank my colleagues for, for their stories, and it just sort of reminded me with my own son, um, and they haven't seen my son in a while, so they probably would be surprised to sort of see the transformation that he's gone through, because he now has started his own sort of locks, and he's, he's got his own little, little, yeah, I know, yes, he, he has locks, and he's got his own, he's got his own little sort of, you know, um, twist to it, um, you know, his hair is sort of shaved halfway and he's got the locks. He's been influenced by professional athletes and he sees them and his daddy, his baba. So, uh, but yeah, so I, I appreciated hearing Dr. Green sort of mention the impact on his daughter because certainly I, I see that with my own kids. Thank you. Thank you for jumping in there and thank you all. Um, before we go, is there anything else that you would like either policymakers or educational administrators to think about? Um, when it comes to black hair and their students? I just think that this discussion we've been having just speaks to the, the deep uh, felt um, expression of our identity that these hairstyles are. So whether you end up growing in locks or just having a bald fade or, you know, keeping your hair another style, like it's, regardless of where you are on your journey, I think it's critical uh, that people uh, understand that it's an aesthetic and it's a, um, it's an embrace of one's identity that's respected. And so I've, I've heard people say the other thing like, well, you know, well, that person doesn't have a natural hairstyle. So therefore, you know, they have a couple other things to say about it. I said, a lot of people are very conflicted about this. Some people would like to have a natural hairstyle, but they feel that they're in a professional space that's not really uh, conducive to it. So um, I often think that people assume that I can, gauge your politics and your stance by your hairstyle. And you'll find a lot of people who do have more traditional hairstyles actually do embrace. Uh, I've had many people with natural, with, um, with permanent, permed hairstyles say to me like, yo, I really love your, I love your hair. I wish I could do something like that myself. And I often say to them, you, you should do it. And they often tell me, well, I work in this space and the space is a little more complicated. And then you're like, yeah, that's, that's different. So everybody's got their own, um, positionality and experience, but, uh, you know, the, the wrong thing to do would be say like, well, people who have natural hairstyles are woke and people who don't are not woke. Um, it's not that, it's not that simple, actually. Thank you for adding that, that additional context. Um, definitely. So, I've, I've seen the same, um, where people will assume that they know, um, when someone has processed hair, what that means about their politics, which, um, they really don't. Well, I, I would say, um, I'll add to that, <clears throat> that as much as I absolutely love the black hair revolution that, that we are enjoying, and that I really believe we probably won't ever really truly go away from it. I don't, I, it would be hard for me to believe that we would move away totally. Um, I also worry that that revolution is not always about solely embracing natural hair. It's about embracing certain kinds of natural hair that looks a certain way. Sometimes, I hate to say that. And so I don't think that we can assume that just because someone is wearing their hair a certain way, again, like you said, that there are, that there's a politics behind that, right? It's not necessarily, maybe it may not be. So I think we have to still do the hard work and the, and, the, and the affirming work of, of talking about our hair and how it's beautiful in all different styles and um, textures um, from dry to you know shiny, whatever it might be, we've got to embrace that. And we need to help our children to embrace that. Because I worry if, if, we, if we throw off the shackles in one instance, Right, so I'm gonna get rid of that, that you know, what, what do they call it, the creamy crack? I'm gonna get rid of, you know, maybe permed hair, or I'm gonna grow my hair out into locks, or I'm gonna wear twists, but only if it looks a certain way. And if it doesn't look a certain way, then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna cover it up, or, um, you know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with wearing my hair like that. So that, I think, is always going to be important for us to be thinking about. And as we're moving forward, to not just make the assumption that we somehow arrived, right? Whiteness, whiteness has a, a, a uncanny way of, of morphing and just reasserting itself. 
right? And so we've got to make sure that it's not morphing and reasserting itself, even as we are trying to embrace um, who we are. Really good point. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for participating. Um, one thing before we go, I wanted to, uh, I miss, misspoke when I gave the title of Dr. Brown's book. It's after the at-risk label. Um, and I also wanted to tell you all that you have all managed to maintain your locks and curls despite quarantine. <laughs> Congratulations to each and every one of you. <laughs> Can I say this? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a, a, a person who's been doing my hair for about two years and, uh, she, and, I've, and I've, been, I've gone pretty frequently, mainly because she has amazing flexibility. Like I get my hair done sometimes at 5.30 in the morning and it just makes it easier for me to be able to go into work. And I'll tell you, when, when we got quarantined, I paid her like I was going every two weeks, but I did not go. I wow. still have not been back to see her, but just to support her, yeah. you know. So I've got quite a bit uh, built up. Built up. <laughs> so I'm looking forward <laughs> to going back. <laughs> When we get out of court, when we really get out of quarantine. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, all of you, for sharing your thoughts, your research, and your lived experience um, here on Talking Eds. Um, Talking Eds is produced by the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you, and take care, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.